for it to actually load because I always do this thing where it gets like audio feedback. <laughs> I'm going to try to avoid that. Um, and then I'll be sure to introduce this. Okay, awesome. I think we're, we are rolling. Uh, all right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the fifth colloquium in our uh, spring colloquium series. Um, my name is Charles Chang. I'm the um, chair of the Emerging Scholars Organizing Committee, and along with the uh, rest of the organizing committee, Kate Lindsay and Danny Erker, and the colloquium committee, Megan Brown and Jenya Lucan, we're very happy to welcome you to our event. Um, and our speaker for today is Megan Burkhart Reed, and we're delighted to have her. Um, with us here today, and um, Professor Lindsay will be introducing her. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Charles. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Megan Burkhart Reed as our colloquium speaker today. Megan is a fifth year doctoral student at the University of Memphis, where she's working towards her PhD in communication sciences and disorders and speech pathology. Her current research focuses on the roles that vocalizations and gestures play for babies during their first and second years of life. Interestingly, her research goes beyond looking at the acquisition of gesture or vocalizations independently, but compares the acquisition of both of these elements um, in a single lifetime and draws connections to the origins of language as well. Throughout her research, Megan has also been developing an important coding scheme for gesture that is comparable to the types of schemes used for coding infant vocalizations. As the field has become increasingly aware of the importance of gesture, both in pre-linguistic communication and in our own linguistic communications, it's clear that this coding scheme is going to be very useful. Alongside her academic work, Megan has also joined efforts to put together a diversity task force for the recruitment of underrepresented groups to programs in speech language pathology and audiology. The goals of this task force are for more students to get exposure to research and research careers at every level of higher education. Today, we have the pleasure of learning more about Megan's work on early vocalizations and gesture. Um, and we're going to be able to come to an understanding about how these pre-linguistic communications support word production and language acquisition. So let's welcome our speaker with our uh, clapping reactions here on Zoom. Um, and thank you, Megan. Take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Let me share my screen again. There we go. All right. OK. So yes, today I'll be talking about exploring the roles of voice and gesture in early communication development. Um, and I really believe that the study of human development can not only reveal a great deal about language and development, but also really inform our understanding of the selection pressures that may have differentiated us um, from our ape relatives. Okay, so I will begin today by giving a little bit of background on gestural origin, on origin theories in general, but we'll start with the gestural origin of language. Um, many have come to believe that language is founded primarily in gesture and that the evolution of vocal language came after a substantial period of growth in gestural communication in the hominin line. Um, so some of these common theoretical bases are ape gestures, um, vocalizations in non-human primates, um, ape language experiments, ontogenesis of speech and gesture, uh, sign languages, speaker gesturing, and adult speech, uh, human adults, neurology, and mirror neuron theory. Um, for the purposes of time and to stay within the scope of my research, we'll really be focusing mostly on ape gestures, uh, vocalization in non-human primates, and then moving on to the ontogenesis of speech and gesture. Okay, so the origin of language has been a long-standing focus of speculation and investigation. Um, theoretical debates about the origin of language center on whether vocalization or gesture played a more fundamental role, uh, with prominent thinkers supporting both possibilities. Um, but both gestural and vocal theories commonly reference the communicative behaviors of non-human primates, 
primarily the great apes, as evidence regarding the origin of language. So many of these prominent researchers cite um, the, that gestures are far more flexible than vocalization in their communication systems, um, with captive apes communicating primarily through gesture. Um, and since great apes are claimed to communicate with this greater flexibility in a visual gestural modality than a vocal one, it's often been argued that our early hominid ancestors, ancestors must have been gestural communicators. Um, so other evidence is that ape relatives do not normally assemble their vocalizations into more complex utterances composed of syllables, words, and sentences as humans do. Um, with some rare but limited exceptions. And the relatively successful sign language learning in great apes raised by humans, but almost a total failure to learn spoken language in the same circumstances is also cited as strong evidence. Um, and these arguments are really to suggest that early hominins still very close to the split from the apes would have also displayed this relative inflexibility prior to evolutionary changes in developmental patterns. Um, so the gesture first really suggests that some remnant of early foundations available during this split should have remained in modern human development. And as a result of this kind of reasoning of these things about ape gestures, um, many have really come to hold this belief. And the premise of my work is really that if gesture really does form the primary foundation for language, it seems reasonable to predict that gestural communication should precede vocal communication in modern human development, um, especially if we kind of even just take the metoric development and put it aside. Um, and this expectation is really kind of consistent with reasoning from evolutionary developmental biology or EvoDevo, uh, which really emphasizes that a widespread tendency for new structural features or capabilities to really evolve, by really evolve by modification of existing features, specifically by changing developmental patterns. And in EvoDevo, it's really not expected that the orders of appearance of major, major structures or behavioral capabilities in development will be reversed in terms of evolutionary orders. Instead, conservation of foundational structures is expected and natural selection is expected to build upon these foundational structures with the developmental sequences staying very consistent with the order of the evolved structures and capabilities. Okay, now the vocal origin of language. So there's a great bulk of theories that also support vocalization as foundational for the origin of language. Um, and they mostly focus on non-human primates, as I said before. And they claim a greater gestural flexibility in apes that uh, that's, the flexibility has really been challenged in recent years, um, with research suggesting that non-human primates may display more flexibility in their vocal production than previously believed. And that a lot of these investigations really seek to reveal continuities and behaviors between human speech and ape vocal communication. And there's some evidence of limited vocal invention and novel vocal learning in great apes. Um, for instance, in a study of kiss squeaks that were recorded from wild orangutans, um, researchers found three different variations of the same call, um, suggesting some volitional control. And there's also been a, some degree of functional and novel call usage um, that's been documented in captive chimpanzees. Okay, and then if we keep with this kind of line of thinking that we should really see some remnants of early hominid evolutionary developmental patterns in modern human development, it really seems reasonable that the best way to kind of understand the emergence of gesture, as well as the relative role gesture may play in communication is by studying modern human development um, from the very first months of life. Um, but what do we really know about gestural development during infancy? Um, first, we know children typically produce their first gestures between nine and 12 months. And there have been several studies of gesture in human infants to suggest some correlation between early gestural development and language development. 
So a few of these studies, for instance, have reported that infants begin using symbolic gestures early in language development to communicate. Um, that gestures appear before talking and correlate strongly with language development. And numerous studies have demonstrated a highly predictive nature of gesture use for later language learning. So some of the first gestures that emerge in infancy are referred to as didactic gestures. So these are things like reaching, showing, offering, pointing, um, with indexical pointing discussed as an especially important gestural behavior, um, forming the basis for primitive dyxis. Um, and these are followed by more performative acts like conventional gestures, which are often the most referenced gestures in the literature. Um, and those are the ones that are kind of culturally defined. So things like learning to clap your hands in exultation. Um, and those develop kind of later in the first year into the second. So recent findings suggest that early didactic gesture use is predictive of later vocabulary in both typical and atypical development, uh, but no other gesture types. Um, pointing is often cited as a prerequisite skill that leads infants down the path towards linguistic communication. And one meta-analysis showed a strong relationship exists between language development and the pointing gesture as it emerges during infancy. Um, so from these perspectives, it's really believed that pointing kind of really provides an opportunity not only for caregivers, but for the infants. Um, it provides an opportunity to label objects that are of shared interest um, so that as infants begin to use this pointing gesture, they're able to kind of designate um, objects in the environment. And this provides an opportunity and a foundation for acquiring new words. Um, so this is kind of the idea of why this is so important. It's very important in autism research, especially. And I'll just go over just a few summarize a few tenets kind of existing within this literature, is that the pointing, which is clearly a kind of gesture, like I said, it develop, this one develops kind of at the end of the first year, but it's confirmed to develop in the second. Um, any aberrations in pointing, especially very delayed development or absence of pointing um, or view, are strong risk signs for autism. And consequently, the study of early gesture, including possible precursors, um, are viewed as, a, as an appropriate target for early detection research. All right, so a few more findings on the predictive value of gesture. So first, um, it's believed that we can predict the size of a child's verbal vocabulary later in development by looking at the number of gestures used early on and that the use of gestures and speech combinations predicts sentence complexity at 36 months. And then the types of objects indicated by gestural use can predict the lexical items that will enter into a child's vocabulary. So kind of going back to this idea that it helps build these triadic relationships between infants and caregivers and, and another object. And then one study found that individual differences in children's early gesture production was predictive of both language development and executive function in early childhood. And finally, a, a study that just came out a couple of months ago actually um, found that the frequency of gesture use is indicative of receptive and expressive language abilities. Um, but the type of gesture examined impacts each of those skills differently. But what about the role of early vocal behaviors. We focus a lot on how gestures are predictive, but we kind of leave the early vocal behaviors a little, a little neglected. Um, this quote is one of my favorites, um, and it's always really resonated with me. It says, perhaps the appearance of intelligible gesture prior to intelligible speech has been reported because adults can more readily interpret semantically a baby's Kinzig expressions than they can its oral expressions. And I think this really highlights a key reason why early vocal behaviors are often left somewhat unexplored, um, not only in the study of the origin of language, but also in the willingness to explore the communicative value of early vocal behaviors. 
Um, the foundational capabilities on the path to spoken language are often left unexplored in very young infants um, because they're unable to produce higher level language features like words or sentences. And it seems really difficult to explain the development of language without understanding the foundational steps that human infants take towards mature speech. So our lab really focuses on infant non-cry speech-like vocalizations or protophones. Um, and they're viewed as a primary, mean, a primary means by which infants communicate with others. Um, and early longitudinal investigations of newborns indicate that infants can produce spontaneous vocalizations from the first weeks of life with a tendency to produce these protophones at a very high rate. So a protophone would be those sounds that you hear like ah or ma or ba um, even though those are more related to canonical syllables, um, we would still consider those protophones or vocans. And recent work shows that protophones occur at a much higher rate than cries, um, which is actually a large focus of a lot of this, a lot of research is that cry is a very prominent feature in very young infants. And we don't really focus on the other sounds that they're making. Um, but preterm and full-term infants can produce protophones at a very high rate from as soon as they can breathe on their own. And although spoken words may not develop until the end of the first year, infants can use vocalizations to communicate needs and emotional states from the first months of life. And by emotional states, um, protophones are often produced with a lot of what we call functional flexibility. Um, so where you have cry that's very tied to negative affect, um, you can't really, until you're more mature, I guess as an adult we can, but as an infant, cry is really tied to negative expression, just as laughter is really only tied to positive expression. Whereas protophones can be produced in really a variety of circumstances. And later speech development is viewed as kind of being built upon this foundation of these, this early vocal production. All right, now the endogenous nature of infant vocalizations, um, which is that they are intrinsically motivated sounds produced for the infant's own purpose has gained a lot of attention in accounts of language, or language origins um, and just language development in general, honestly. Um, the massive amount of early infant vocal behavior and communication has emphasized, um, is emphasized by those who really advocate a primarily vocal foundation. And it's claimed that the endogenous nature of early human infant vocal behaviors really provides evidence for the foundational role of vocalization in language acquisition, um, which is really founded in the notion that hominin infants, which were more altricial than their ape relatives, and thus under a heightened selection pressure um, to signal wellness. So the idea is that infant protophones are continue to be under this type of selection pressure as a fitness signal in human infancy. And a reliable fitness signal used by infants needs to be salient and consistently perceived. Um, and infants appear to be kind of just doing this vocal expiration. So Long et al. found that infants in the first year produce the majority of their vocalizations, protophones specifically, independent of social engagement. Specifically, three times as many endogenous vocalizations as socially directed ones. And another study, um, which is about modeling of infant vocal development with computer and robotic simulations has added a little bit more support for intrinsic motivation by um, showing that, emphasizing that first vocalizations as the result of this vocal expiration um, led to a progressive mastery of capabilities required for, for speech such as phonation. Now, getting closer to the focus of my work that I'll be presenting today, um, there's new evidence that su suggests that 
the, this early phonological development may be far more important than previously thought in the creation of the lexicon and also predicting language outcomes. And these new findings are some of the first to really evaluate what aspects of infants' pre-linguistic communication are the most valuable for learning to speak that really seem to support vocalization over gesture. So part of this is that babbling and pointing in one study um, did not develop in tight synchrony. And the babble onset alone was predictive of first words. Um, also, infants gaze coordinated vocalizations that are met with timely and contingent, contingent caregiver response were the best predictor of expressive language development up to two years when compared to gesture. And the predictive value of vocalizations in general may not solely derive from just being motoric prerequisites to speech, but also from being attempts to communicate intentionally. So aside from just endogenous production, um, some infants communicate purely for interaction or to signal um, wellness. Um, and this is, I guess, where cry would come in, um, signaling that they need something or signaling that they're doing just fine. All right. So we will get to the current study that I will be talking about. Um, so now that we've discussed some of the background that motivated this work, um, I really, the, our main hypotheses were really two going into this. First, in accord with common reasoning, um, we wanted to determine, um, we, we believe that gestural communication should, should precede vocal communication in human development. And secondly, gestures more often than protophone should be accompanied by gaze direction toward a person as an indicator of directedness or intent to communicate. So we really just asked, what is the simply the rate of occurrence of things that could potentially be deemed gestural compared to the protophones during the first year? So our methods. Um, we selected um, available longitudinal audio video recordings from our University of Memphis archives. So our participants were 10 infants, five male, five female, all normally hearing. And the recordings were 20 minute naturalistic recordings obtained at four, seven and 11 months approximately. Um, we refer to them usually as an early, a middle and a late age. And Parents were instructed to interact naturally with their infants um, in a recording playroom with cameras in each of the four corners and wireless microphones worn by both the infants and the parents. And all of the selected recordings came from interactive se sessions between the parents and the infants. So it would be set up with toys and the parents would be instructed to interact. Okay, and here, this is a, these images are of our coding system. So in the top figure on, of the ACT screen, um, the, this coding was completed using, it stands for Action Analysis Coding and Training Software, and it facilitates simultaneous coding of digital video and audio. Um, so the ACT program includes two channels of video that's synchronized with audio for frame level accuracy, um, which are synchronized and coordinated with audio represented in a spectrogram waveform display in TF32. And this system per permits coding in multiple fields, either separately or at the same time. And then the bottom figure is the actual display of this kind of setup. So you'd have, the, it illustrates the two video displays, um, which are synchronized and coordinated with the audio display, which is the kind of gray looking bar below it. Um, and that includes both a waveform and a spectrogram. And then the right side of the screen, um, there's a menu panel on with uh, three overlapping coding panels. Um, and the coder is able to really select um, their cursor placements on the audio screen 
Um, and then they can play that selected sequence as many times as desired um, in a loop. So the coder is also able to drag the cursor um, on the audio display with the corresponding frame accurate changes in the video from both cameras. Um, so the, you can actually watch it at frame by frame in slow motion, um, which allows um, the selection of an onset and offset points for gestural events. So the primary modalities of interest for this study were gesture vocalizations or protophones um, and gaze direction as an indicator of intent. And the data for the protophones in this study had been previously coded during another study. Um, and the gestures were located first using a real-time analysis of infant recordings. Um, so we just played the 20 minute segments and watched it all the way through. Um, and we did that to kind of gain a context for the interaction between the parent and the child. Um, and we'll talk about the gestures of interest on the next slide, which will kind of let us talk a little bit about the coding scheme that we designed for this. Okay, so then once identified, um, we were able to create that boundary for the onset and the offset um, for each gesture. So we actually were able to capture snapshots of infants moving into the action and then coming out of it. And then we also coded the gaze direction um, it'd be each, for each gesture where at least one of the two video angles allowed such a judgment. Um, so the coding indicated whether infants gestured or vocalized while looking at another person or while not looking. Okay, now our gesture coding is really, was really designed to focus on acts of the first year that could be deemed precursors to sign, um, that is precursors to gestural symbols across the first year of life, um, and or precursors to non-symbolic gestures as they occur in mature persons, usually accompanied by speech. Um, so the list was really intended to include all the actions that could conceivably be interpreted as communicative gestures. And the list includes all of the gesture types that we actually witnessed in our sample. Um, the terms are largely drawn from literature on ape and human infant gesture. Um, so these are, this is how we kind of categorize these. So um, utilitarian, um, they're, they're organized in terms of our proposed hierarchy of actions leading to toward language-like gestures. Um, so the utilitarian acts are those that serve a utilitarian function um, or that are simply just world exploratory actions, not intended as communications. Um, so the following data that we'll talk about don't include any of these purely utilitarian movements. Um, the non-social gestures um, are the ones, are gestural acts that have no explicit social intent, but they're also not utilitarian. So these would be things like handshaking, which you could consider like hand banging um, rhythmic hand banging um, that usually kind of coincides with the onset of babbling. Um, hand positions, so these would be things like D hands or positions that might be similar to those that you would see in sign language. Um, foot shakes, um, same foot shakes would also be rhythmic. Um, kicks and body rocks, which can also be rhythmic. Sometimes I found that the infants would begin in a handshake and continue the same rhythmic motion through a full body rock. Okay, the next category is universal social gestures. And those are, those are, are the, these are the ones that seem to have an explicitly social function. So this is where the deictic gestures would fit in. Um, so things like reaching to request um, or pointing to designate an object or share focus, um, touching another person to gain their attention and so on. Um, so even on this list, we can go down and like turning away. So maybe an infant turns their face away to reject. Maybe someone's trying to feed them and they wanna show that they, they don't wanna be fed. So they turn their face away um, or blocking the face in the same kind of circumstance. Um, covering the face. We saw a lot of that in games of peekaboo, 
um, or there's one infant that covered her face um, in sadness because her mother wouldn't give her a toy that she wanted. Um, and then throw and push are included in this category as well, um, especially when they were included in things that could be considered social games. And then you have conventional performative gesture. Um, conventional gestures are those um, kind of what we talked earlier that are presumed to be culturally specific or culturally transmitted acts um, that have a discernible communicative function. Um, so head shake, um, something like that would maybe be um, nodding for yes or shaking your head for no, um, clapping your hands in exultation, um, uh, nodding, um, which we consider different, I guess, because head shake we really considered more for shaking your head back and forth in descent. Um, and then arm up um, to be to request to pick up, which actually we determined was kind of an ambiguous category, even though we left it here, um, because it does seem that reaching your arms up seems more universal. I can't think of an infant that doesn't use that motion to request to be picked up. Um, shrugging, um, putting your palms up for I don't know or uh-oh, um, your hands to cheek, maybe in surprise, um, and then hand wave for greetings or goodbye. And here is what we found. So when we took all this together and looked at this at each of these ages for our 10 infants, uh, what we found is that the rate of protophones compared to gestures was a, a lot higher. Um, so we'll first consider just the simple rate of protophone production compared to that. So the bars in blue represent the gestures per minute um, at the three ages, and the orange represents the protophones per minute. And the data on protophone and gesture rates across all 30 recordings um, for the three ages for the first year revealed vastly more protophones than gestures. So this, the actual number was there were 3,730 protophones um, that were coded and only 738 gestures using the criteria that we distinguished for coding. Um, so the data of these three ages really shows how infrequently gestures occurred. Um, it was really less than one per minute at the first stage, um, increasing to about 1.6 to two per minute at the later ages, um, falling to five per minute kind of at the oldest for protophones, excuse me. So We'll start with the early age. That's probably makes more sense. Um, so the protophones occurred at least eight times per minute at the youngest age. Um, and then they fall to about five towards the oldest age. Um, now, one thing to talk about here is that this trend, it kind of looks like the protophone production goes down. Um, there are two reasons that I think that this kind of occurred in this sample. Um, first, the infants were kind of in a novel setting. Not only that, um, the parents at the early age were really kind of steering a lot of these interactions. Um, the infants were not very mobile. Um, they were usually in an exorciser or a high chair um, in the lab, and they weren't, they weren't crawling or walking yet. Um, so the parents were directly in their face. Um, but then you get towards the middle and late age where crawling and walking are kind of coming in and the interaction is kind of being steered in a different direction. Um, so we don't believe that this trend is actually reflective of production of vocalization going down, but more the circumstance of the laboratory setting combined with the mobility of the infants. And then we also had, we also conducted peer T tests on this data, um, which we actually got a lot of questions about why we decided to do that. And honestly, we were just wanted to, wanted to do pairwise, pairwise comparisons. Um, and this data was very categorical and longitudinal at the same time. And it really didn't warrant a more elaborate analysis 
just to kind of look at this, but we did find that these differences between the number of gestures and protophones across all three ages, um, they were statistically significant and the effects were large as well. Um, and next we'll look at the directivity of these events across the first year. Okay, so this figure shows the percentage of gestures and protophones that were directed and not directed by gaze at each of the three ages. And if you note, at all three ages, only about 21% or less of the gestures were directed toward another person. Um, so for protophones, the infants directed their vocalizations toward a person far more often at every age, uh, with directivity being its highest at four months. Um, and it seems reasonable uh, that the apparent gaze directivity during vocalizations may decrease, kind of as I said before, because just as the infants gained more independence um, and they began to really explore the world, whereas those younger infants were really kind of being directed by the parent more often uh, because they were less mobile. At the earliest age, uh, the imbalance of favoring protophones over gestures for directivity was at its highest. Um, however, um, it's important to note that the majority of events in either modality were not directed toward a person. And there were so few gestures at the earliest age that um, the directivity proportion may not be completely reliably determinable. Um, because infants were producing so few uh, and some infants were producing so many, produced more, and then some infants didn't produce any at all. So we did have some infants that never produced at that earliest age. All right, and then the distribution of gesture types. So the gesture types, um, based on the literature's focus on gesture and the development of language, um, we kind of thought that there would be an ex and a more extensive utilization of conventional gestures by 11 months and presumably more conventional gestures than conventional vocalizations. Um, so we kind of completed this analysis kind of after the fact, um, even though we didn't really specify these things in terms of these categories, um, we deemed it kind of informative to really present uh, to evaluate the number of tokens of conventional vocalizations across the three ages. Um, because we did not code vocalizations as conventional, universal, social, or non-social. And one of the reasons that we didn't do this is because it's kind of difficult other than conventions to ever, to really deem vocalization, to really distinguish between non-social and universally social vocalizations. So our count of tokens for conventional vocalizations um, yielded 50, which is more than the conventional gestures uh, that were observed. And those tokens for the conventional vocalizations, which we would consider early words or attempts at words, expressions um, included things like mama, dada, bye-bye, no-no, um, yum-yum, mm, and yeah. And overall, Neither of neither the conventional gestures or the conventional vocalizations were frequent compared to the much larger number of universal social and non-social acts. Um, furthermore, pointing, um, which is known is a known form is known to form a foundation for word learning, um, it occurred far less frequently than we expected. So within this universal social category. Um, Pointing only, we only recorded 12 pointing events at the latest age, um, with really only two of the 10 infants having pointed during these naturalistic interactions in the laboratory setting, um, which, and then reaching, um, including merely reaching toward an object and not obtaining it with help, offering an object or accepting an object accounted for 48% of all the gestures that we witnessed. Um, suggesting that the declarative function of pointing, thought to be so important as the foundation for language, um, occurs far less frequently than the instrumental functions associated with early reaching. 
Um, and given it's obvious important, I think we were really surprised to kind of see that pointing was so infrequent. But we really did find that the universal social acts appeared to play a really special role in development here. Um, that they kind of have an advantage over um, the community, oh, excuse me, they have an advantage over vocalization at this stage. Um, there were 395 cases of universal social gesture across the entire first year. Um, the most over the other types. And the universal social gestures really have this ability to kind of communicate a clear intent. Um, so we did find support for that, that aspect. Um, so often they, these were of a didactic nature, um, indicating that the infant wanted something or something that the infant wanted another person to look at, even though that was infrequent. Um, but vocalizations really have to become symbolic in order to serve this type of didactic function. Um, for example, an infant can gesture by extending his or her arm to signal the desire to be picked up, but there's no real equivalent in the vocal domain without words. Um, so I guess the conclusions that we really drew from this particular study um, were that vocalization was overwhelmingly predominant over gesture and communication of the first year, and especially early in the first year. Um, that there was vocal predominance, that this vocal predominance applied whether the communication was directed or not directed by gaze toward another person. Thus, vocalization appears to be utilized explicitly for communication to a vastly greater extent than gesture in the first year. Um, even though we saw quite a bit of universal social gestures being used. And since gesture is inherently visual, it requires the recipient to be looking in order for a communication to occur. Yet the gesturing babies uh, relatively rarely looked to see if a potential recipient was looking at them, but the vocalizing infants looked much more often. In fact, an infant vocalizing looked toward a potential recipient 74% more frequently than an infant gesturing. And then these results also dramatically contradict this assumption that gesture is predominant in early infant communication and suggest that gesture may not be a primary, the primary foundation for language. On the contrary, the results are consistent with a suggestion that vocalization is and always has formed a more important foundation for language than gesture. Um, and then we also considered some clinical implications for this, especially since gesture is viewed as a great way for early detection research. Um, that if we're really seeking signs of deviation in normal development from the first months of life, um, for example, in emergent autism or even specific language impairment, um, it could be kind of difficult to use gesture as a target for our research, um, especially because we know gesture doesn't really appear until nine to 12 months. And even the gestures that appear before then appear to be non-social in nature. Um, but vocalization and gaze direction um, appear to be possible indicators of aberrant behavior from the first month. Um, infants are endogenously producing these protophone sounds. Um, and even though they're not socially directing as very, really as often as previously believed, um, they're still using gaze direction more often than with gestures. And that is actually the end of my presentation for today. Um, I will just talk a little bit about, though, our plans for future research, which I did not think to add to this. Um, because of what we found for the conventional gesture uh, versus the conventional tokens, um, we decided to actually look into the second year and just look at the frequency of conventional gestures versus conventional vocalizations. Um, so we're actually going to be doing that comparison very soon um, to look at just how much is this conventional language occurring, especially because it is viewed to be important 
Um, and we found that it, it occurred so infrequently at that latest age, uh, we wanted to see how much that translated into the second year. Okay, thanks very much, Megan. Uh, giving you virtual applause here. I'm gonna, 